It feels really great to pray, doesn't it? People, this should be a house of prayer. You know, we do so many things here. We praise God and tell the kids stories and we talk and we do games and we run around. But Jesus has one text and says, My house shall be called a house of prayer. And I'm going to, in 15 minutes, talk to you about this. Why is that? Why is this so important? Why you, why I would gain if we make our body a house of prayer and our church a house of prayer and our home a house of prayer and our community is a house of prayer. I think there is a power there. There is a real practical power in this thing. And uh, thank you so much for participating with us this morning. When you got up, it felt a little bit weird to go and join somebody you don't know and pray that they pray over you. But I hope you receive blessing. And I hope you understand that this church does love you. And our God does love you. And we want this church to be a family, close-knit family, where we know each other, where we pray for each other, where we really live together, that we're not just friendly church, but we are a church of friends. And this doesn't happen without sharing and praying and together as well. This last week, again, not last week, 10 days, we spent time praying and we received a lot of prayer requests. And it's interesting to look at kind of categories of those prayer requests. We prayed for people, family, family members who are not in the safety of God's grace yet, who have either walked away, who are doubting their faith right now, or who have not made this important step to come to Christ. We prayed for them. If you are in this group, we have prayed for you as well. We prayed for those people who, have, who are struggling with family relationships. There is some breaking down in family relationships. Someone doesn't talk to their children or to their parents and so on. It's a complicated life. We prayed for those. Perhaps we prayed for you as well. We prayed for health problems and issues that people have. And I know many of those are happening around this church, this city, this world. It's a sick world, <laughs> I always say to people. Uh, we prayed about emotional hurts or, uh, or injury or stress that people have experienced either at this church or at their workplace or at their home or somewhere else. It's not exactly a health issue, but it's he being heavily on some people's heart as well. We prayed for people who are asking for wisdom from God. They're on the crossroad. They need to change jobs or enroll for university or change the school or don't know exactly how the relationship is going with a girlfriend or boyfriend. And we pray for you as well if you are on the crossroad there as well. And then last one, last group, which we found is simple names. Some people didn't say anything, just simple names, list of names. Pray for them. And we say we are happy to do this because we don't know who and what to pray for, but we know one who knows this person better than they know themselves. So we prayed for them as well. And do you know what? God has answered every one of these prayers. In his time, he has answered any all of these prayers. So we are asking yourself, why? why? What would it look like if you made this church a house of prayer? What's the important thing to remember when we talk about prayer? Usually when I was a kid, I got to tell you, I got bored with prayer. It would be just felt, oh man, seriously, I have closed my eyes again. And being a boy, I love running, I love jumping, I love pff, hitting stuff. I don't like close my eyes and pray. But this is what the Bible says. We were kids, and then we grow up, and we grow up to learn what we really need. And so today I still hit stuff and run around, but I stop and pause to make sure I pray because it's so important. Why is it so important? I want to talk to you about four elements of the prayer. First prayer, and each of these elements is connected to a, quick, to a story from the Bible. First story is the story, story of Moses. You remember Moses. Amalekites are attacking Israelites. These guys, Israelites, don't have any weapons. And there's a whole horde of these people attacking these uh, people just come out as slaves out of Egypt. What does Moses do? Does he gather a plan and say, we are in huge trouble. We will be extinct by, by sundown if we don't do something. These guys are mighty warriors. There are many of them. What do we do? And he grabs one of the younger guys, he says, 
just grab your warriors and go there and, and, and stand there and see what you can do. I, in meanwhile, am going to climb a, I want to say a tree, but it was a mountain with Aaron and Joshua and they are there and Caleb and saying, what we can do here is not to make a plans because right now there is no time for it. We can pray. And you remember the story. Moses comes and is a little child that is running and falls down. And I don't have a children, but those of you who do, I've observed it. When, when I was a kid, when, first thing, when I was hurting and when I, was, uh, when I fell, I just wanted to find my parent and say, Hey, I'm hurting here. I'm going to cry loud now until you notice me and do something about this. And this is what Moses do, does. He goes and he lifts his arm and he says, Lord, we are in a huge trouble. Help us. And then he prays and prays and prays and he gets tired and he can't go down. And then he goes again and prays and prays and prays and he gets tired and his hands grow down. And they observe something. Every time his hands are up, they are winning. Every time his hands are down, they are losing. A pattern emerges. And so they sit him down and are on one side, and I think it was Josh on the other side, hold his hand. And when his hands are up, they are winning. It's very interesting. You know, you, you can ask me how prayer works. And you can get into philosophical, theological, or logical questions that you can tangle yourself in such a knot that you will come to the conclusion, well, I don't know why I'm praying at all. God knows everything He can do. He loves me enough and so on. And you will miss on this important thing. This is how it works, people. I, I can't explain this to you like, like, like quarks in the physics. You can't explain how they work, but they work. And here is how prayer works. When your hands are up, you're winning. When your hands are down, you're losing. You got it? Okay, this is complicated. So when your hands are, say with me, up, you are what? Exactly. When your hands are down, did you get this? Okay. My job done. <laughs> it is as simple as this. Every time you pray, you are going to win for your relationships, for your job, for patience, for love, for whatever. Wherever you neglect to win, whenever there is something more important than prayer, you will not be able to have this strength as with God. The second, the second learn what that we learn is the second story we learn about prayer. It comes from the king Hezekiah. This huge army of Assyrians simply say, "We are the bullies. We are too strongest. We want to conquer all the nations. Israel, you are the next. Give us all your money." And then we're going to tell you what to do, and you will be nobody. And Hezekiah says, no, I'm not going to do this. And the general said, what do you mean, no? Everybody else, look, everybody else. Do you see those people? Burn cities, you know, kill people. Who will save you? Your God? <laughs> Come on, look at the science of the thing. We are unstoppable. It, it's provable. Which God do you serve that he will save you? And the conversation goes like this. Do you know what Hezekiah does? And here we learn the purpose of prayer. Hezekiah goes on his ground. He, lay, he lays down, basically. He doesn't lift his hands up. So this is lesson one. You can do prayer in any kind of position you want to. But he says this. This is how his prayer starts. O Lord, God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Now, help me understand this. Outside of his city, this huge army. Why doesn't he pray like this? God, help us defeat the enemy. Why does he start with this statement? Looking at this sentence, you would think, it's perfectly peace. It looks like he is not worried right now. It looks like, well, you know, there may not be an army. There may be or may not be. But his prayer says something about importance of prayer. He says, this is the lesson number one from this story. When we come before God with our burdens and all of us, when we need to pray, we need to pray for something which burdens us. Rarely do we just come before the Lord and say, Lord, I praise you because you are good, which we should be doing. But we come God burdened. 
But here is a lesson that you and I and I particularly need to learn. When we give God glory first, we remind ourselves who we are praying to. We are not just whispering those words in the room or these prayers actually do travel even if you don't feel like it. And so he's saying like this, first thing I'm going to do is, if I want to pray sincerely, remind myself who this God is. This God he has created the heaven and the earth. He is the creator and he alone, he alone is all over the kingdom of the earth. Other gods are not. That's why they get defeated. He gets himself grounded in the truth. In the understanding of how reality really is. Not in the understanding of how your enemy wants you to believe what your reality is. Because your enemy will always try to get you down. Your God, people, is an imaginary friend. Your God is just kind of some ancient story and myth. Your God does not hear you because he doesn't exist. And meanwhile, you're thinking, well, you know what? Why pray? The enemy will always take away your strength from you. And people who are telling you these stories are not your enemy, but they are inspired and guided by the enemy. They don't know what they do. We'll talk about this in the end. But remember, if you believe the truth, if you remind yourself first of all who God is, then you are encouraged and trusting in the Lord and then you can better see your problems, your burdens, and the reality around you. The second thing we learn from Ezekiel's prayer is this. This is how he prays about the victory. Now, O now, oh Lord our God, deliver us from his hand so that all kingdoms on earth may know that you alone, O oh Lord our God. He prays the so that prayer. When you pray, what does your prayer look like? What's your so that? You may pray like, Lord God, heal me so I can, in my instance, ride a bicycle. Lord, please help me lose weight so I can ride faster than Bruce Dever, who always beats me up. <laughs> Lord, please, you know, um, give me a job so I can buy a new house. Lord, please heal my relationship with my wife, with my children, with my friends, so we can go and uh, eat a happy Christmas meal. All of these are prayers are valuable and good, and, and particularly needed, especially in my case when I want to ride fa bicycle faster than Bruce. But all of these things are just temporary so that eventually all health that you are praying for is going to deteriorate and you will die. Eventually, your family, if Jesus doesn't come soon, will die. Eventually, when you find this decision you're looking for, there will be another decision that you will need to find. And while we need to pray for all these temporary gains, and God will listen and answer to this, let me suggest to you some bigger so that. Hezekiah, Hezekiah is praying, Lord, defeat the enemy, defeat my health, defeat my joblessness, defeat my confusion, defeat anything that is in my life, so that you may be praised. So that all know that you are our Lord, our God. Why should we pray like this? Do you know why? Because if the Lord if everybody knows that the Lord is the God of the earth, then there will be peace. Then there will be abundance. Then there will be a better relationships. Then there will be more of jobs and not selfishness. Then in all areas, wherever people believe that God is the ruler of the earth, God of love and justice, there will be better things happening. And this is our witness. We don't live for ourselves. Hezekiah realizes he doesn't live for himself. His purpose is to serve God. So the purpose of our prayer is to give God the glory. Finally, there is, third, there is Daniel. He teaches us about consistency of prayer. You remember the, the Daniel 
and his interesting situation he got himself into. He's praying every day, and some people hate him. There is always an enemy, there is always opposition, and they try to get him down. Not because they can find fault with him, but because they want his position, they want his influence. And so they talk to king, and the king issues a degree that only to him they would pray. Everybody, the whole kingdom, would only pray to the king. It must have to do something with the allegiance and loyalty because the, those ancient kings were always a little bit paranoid if people follow them or not, just like today's politicians are a little bit. It's hard to keep your constituency close to. So he says, everybody prays only to me, nobody else. And so enemy of Daniel now know what's going to happen. They, they go and watch Daniel. Now Daniel has choices. He can stop praying altogether or just pray to the king. He could hide and pray in a hidden, like hidden somewhere else. Nobody can see him. Nobody would know. Not with open eyes, eating, dear Lord, thank you, eating and stuff. He could climb on the top of the building and say, I protest this horrible edict. I am going to pray publicly. You can't stop me. <laughs> or fourth option that he does, it says here now, when Daniel learned that the decree has been published, he went home into his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. In Daniel's reality, nothing changed. And so people say, look, if you continue this, we'll throw you in the dens of lion. And do you know what Daniel says? With his action, he says this, you will just have to feed me to the lions. This is what it will take for me to, stay praying, pr to stop praying to God. If you throw me to lions, they eat me, then I'll stop. But not before that. Why? Is Daniel some kind of legalist or something? Why does he refuse to stop praying? There's nothing legalistic about his prayers, people. But he realizes that had his own people pray to God and give him the glory, they would not be in the slavery they are right now. The salvation is only from the Lord. And he has this, if you want me to call it urge, dependency, need to be close to his God. And nothing will separate him from his right to talk to his Father. And there is this stuff I learned about Consistency of prayer, always, every day, communicate with the Lord. I will stop only if lions come, but not before. Would be beautiful if we did the same? If we stopped our work, if we stopped our car driving, if we stopped ourselves in the middle of this swear word, in the middle of some big decision, and we say, I am going to pray, nothing will stop me from doing this. Lastly, Jesus. Jesus' prayer is talking to us about the heart of the prayer. Jesus prays one simple prayer. He has many prayers, but this is one prayer I chose. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. At which point is Jesus praying this prayer? Where is Jesus at this point when he is praying this prayer? Turn to the person next to you and tell them, where is Jesus when he is praying his prayer? Jesus is on the cross. And he looks down and people are killing him. And they don't know why. They think they have some good motives they think that this is necessary. They think they are right. They think the whole nation will profit if they kill him. They have their reasons. And Jesus knows how confused this world is. How many gods they serve when they say they serve no God. He knows how clever the enemy is to confuse us with so many denominations, with so many ideologies, with so many theories. And he prays one simple prayer, God, 
They don't know why they are killing me, why they are swearing at me, why they are turning away from me, why they never talk to me, why they go against me. But forgive them and give them wisdom so they know what they are doing. So how do you pray this prayer? Do you know how I pray this prayer? I pray this prayer like this. Father, forgive me. Because I don't know what I'm doing so often. I get preoccupied with things that really don't matter in the long term. I miss things and I don't do things which are really so important. My vision is just so full of things that eventually will hurt me, isolate me, deprive me from the real content in the life which you want to give me. I am in a need of your grace of your guidance. I'm well. I have enough money. I'm not lacking for food, for shelter, for health or justice. But I'm lacking your holiness. I'm lacking your leadership. I'm lacking your presence. Because although you are always here, I don't always let you in my heart. So Father, forgive me because I don't know what I'm doing. Do you know what would happen if we all pray this prayer? You would abandon your own wisdom, which is so often not wisdom, and you know it, I know it. And I would rely fully on Christ alone to be my God, to be my guide, to be my holiness. And something beautiful would happen. I would be changed. The people around me would be changed. And my heart, my home, my church would become a house of prayer. House of prayer. We can turn to Him for your needs. We can pray with a greater purpose in this house of prayer. We can develop a habit of being in a communication with Him constantly. If we would humble ourselves and stop making mistakes then we would live in God's wisdom. We would be led by God. And if this all happened, do you know what would happen? What would we have? We would have love for God because we would realize just what a great God He is. We would have joy in our heart because we would be living life of constant adventure with God and with life with greater purpose. We would have peace in our life because we would know that our Father can listen to us in our worst moments. We would have patience because we would know that God is working according to His schedule and He always answers the prayers. We would have kindness because we would have sympathy towards people that we are praying for. And Jesus says, pray for your enemy as well as for everybody else. We would be fa have faithfulness because we would see how faithful God is to us. We would have gentleness because we would realize just how gentle God is with our sin and our inconsistencies. We would have self-control because we would practice this prayer every day, all moments, being in touch with Him. And we, if you would have noticed this, would have fruit of Spirit in our heart. We would have Holy Spirit in our heart, in our mind, upon, upon ourselves, this church will be blessed. This church will be absolutely wonderful place to live. Do we have a last song? Climb up, guys. We will love this year to create a house of prayer in this home. We would love you to know that when you are going on Thursday and thinking, I feel so low right now, I can't even pray, I can't even think about the church, that you would have one thought, if I come to this church, somebody will pray with me. Someone will t put my arms around me and say, tell me about this, and I care about this. I'm going to remind you about the bigger reality, about bigger perspective. I'm going to drag you out of your selfish pit, of out your pit of, of a pit of self-pity and of your just apathy. And I'm going to pray you closer to God. We wanted to do this because we care about our God and we care about you. 
We have a fantastic prayer team this year. And I would just like to invite you, if you would like to try this, just try this today. Come forward. There will be a few people here, like CJ and Robin, and they will pray with you to God. May this house be house of prayer. Amen.